Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ascend Together. Um, my name is Ann Mosley. I'm a vice president here at the Aspen Institute and executive director of Ascend at the Aspen Institute. Uh, Ascend Together is a monthly webcast that makes space for conversations with inspiring and amazing leaders working to advance equity and opportunity for all families, children, and women is what we're going to focus on today. Um, I encourage you all to join us at the Institute um, following our Twitter and chime in. Today, as we recognize um, the milestone, the 101 year mark of the suffrage movement and Women's Equality Day, and also recognizing Labor Day, we really wanted to send, center this conversation of Ascend Together in the power of women's leadership, which we believe is undeniable and unmatched. As we go into this conversation, I really want to underscore the importance of like how we learn from history and how history infuses and, and shapes the context and the conditions we live in today. And history is being made also every day. It's alive. So when we think about the conversation of unmatched and undeniable, the power of women's leadership, when I think about contemporary leaders that are making history every day, I think about Nicole Hannah-Jones, who changed the conversation and brought in the conversation in journalism with her seminal 1619 project. I think about leaders like Ajahn Pu, who have centered the economic and rebuilding conversations to ensure the future of care, paid leave, recognition and respect for domestic workers is central to our economic conversations. When I think about cab leaders like Deb Holland, the current cabinet secretary for the Department of Interior and former member of Congress and Native woman leader, showing the power of representation, bringing indigenous values and strengths to the centrality of our policy world and conversations. So with no further ado, I want to just ground our conversation in a moment with a few key facts, and then we're going to move into an incredible dialogue with three amazing, phenomenal women leaders um, to inspire us today about the opportunity to drive for change and economic, political, and, so and social full participation centered in women's leadership. So let's just look at a couple key um, uh, data points to get us started. First, I think it's really important to recognize um, that women's suffrage and the passage of the 19th Amendment, which we celebrate as an important milestone, did not actually center all women. It really wasn't until 1965 when we saw the passage of the Civil Rights um, Voting Act, Voting Right Acts, that we saw um, democracy and the power and the ability to vote really be open to all women not just white women. And I think as we think about where the state of our democracy is right now and the role that women are playing to ensure that all can vote and participate and have their voices be hard, heard, it's important to make sure that we're thinking about all women and people's rights to vote. And I think about the lesson from 1913 and the first women's suffrage movement when women were protesting um, actions that were, you know, undercutting women, especially by President Woodrow Wilson. And at that first Women's March um, in 1913, it was Ida B. Wells, the iconic activist and, and Black woman journalist who refused to accept the segregationist frame to the actual march and said, either I go with you or not at all. And she marched at the front um, and center of that important um, moment to raise up women's voices. I think we can continue to channel her courage and her vision as we go forward together. Second, when we think about the importance and the incredible uh, strength and history and leadership from Native American women and their role in actually early shaping and influencing and actually ahead of the conversations around women's equality, equity, and leadership. When we think about, um, in history, we hear a lot about um, suffragists like Elizabeth um, Cady Stanton, but we don't hear as much about how she was influenced and inspired by the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and people and the six nations of the Iroquois Confederacy that actually 
helped educate and inspire suffragists like Elizabeth Cady Stanton from their history and their actually their civic structures that centered in women's leadership, full rights, and economic participation. Third, when we think about this incredible moment in time we're in right now, um, as our country is rebuilding and defining the future for generations to come, examining issues, whether they're at the community level or at the policy level, we are not going to be able to go forward without embracing a racial and gender lens that is grounded in intersectionality and full inclusion and leaves no one behind. Um, if any of you have time to take a look at the state of the field, two generation approaches fueling family well-being, you'll see some in-depth analysis that really lifts up both the opportunity we have at the highest levels of the US government, um, both with the leadership of the Biden-Harris Gender Policy Equity Council, as well as the executive order to advance racial equity and ensure that underserved communities are fully served and included in policy conversations. So as we take a look at where we've come, let's most importantly look at where we're going. And today we have a conversation with three amazing leaders that I'm pleased and privileged and honored to call both my colleagues, partners, and dear friends. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Lola Adedokin. Lola is the program director for the Child and Family Wellbeing Portfolio and also the African Initiatives at the Doris Duke Charitable Fo um, Foundation based in New York City. Lola is a fierce champion in the philanthropic sector for women, equity, um, and gender and racial justice. Lola, it's great to see you. Um, I also would like to next rec um, uh, introduce you to Nick Nikki Petrie. Um, Nikki is a dear colleague and partner here at the Aspen Institute, where she serves as the executive director of the Center for Native American Youth. Um, watch out later this month. Nikki will also be joining myself and Peggy Clark as a co-chair of the Aspen Forum on Women and Girls as the platform here at the Aspen Institute that is solely focused on the advancement of women and girls, Black, Latinx, Indigenous, Asian American, Pacific Islander, immigrant, LGBTQ, recognizing the full spectrum of gender and identity and power and opportunity. Nikki, great to see you. And third, it's my delight to introduce Gail Golden. Gail Golden is a courageous and bold state elected leader serving as a state senator in Rhode Island and also on the national stage as a campaign advisor to Family Values at Work, the leading organization demanding that we recognize full support, um, economic respect and care to ensure paid family sick medical leave and respect for all workers is included. Gail, it's great to see you as well. Um, so let's bring everybody together and kick off the conversation. Um, I'd love to, you know, we've talked a little bit about history to get started. A lot of important history, a lot of shoulders that we all build upon. Um, incredible energy demands, work left to be done when we think about the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, um, all the different um, threads of energy and leadership that are simmering and connecting across our country. And so when we think about women's ability to exercise their power and influence, what do you see that has maybe gone unnoticed or is that secret sauce that um, we need to be paying more attention to? So Lola, I'd love to kick it to you first to share your thoughts and a little bit about what brings you to this conversation and your passion. Absolutely, thanks for having and it's a pleasure to be on the stage with such heroes. Um, what I find, none of this is going to be revolutionary, Anne, but um, what I find is women work on the margins because they understand what it feels like to be marginalized. But at this moment, we have made such headway on marginalized issues that are typically labeled as women's issues. We now see them as everyone's issues. Um, with that in mind, what's exciting to see is how these communities are coming together. And you named earlier that intersectionality is key. When we see women, we see all women, Black women, Native American women, Hispanic women, um, women from all communities. And if we can take this moment, come together as partners, as, we, as we've seen with the Black Lives Matters movement, 
with our uh, Native American Indigenous colleagues who have come in support of this movement together and aligned in ways that have pushed conversations far further than we ever thought we would have. Um, what I hope is in the future, we continue. We are an army. Um, we have been uh, forced to be at the center of many conversations. And now what I hope, especially from my purview and philanthropy, is that our philanthropic colleagues take this moment to invest in their vision, see them in every room, see them in every space, support them, give them a platform to speak on. Um, we're at uh, such an interesting um, period in history that is so exciting, but so fragile. And so I hope that we can um, take this moment of fragility and, and use it as our superpower, actually, um, because we know what it's like to be in fragile spaces. Uh, and so that's, that's, my, that's my vision. That's my hope as we go forward. Lola, thank you so much. Powerful and important words to start us on. Um, Nikki, I'd love to invite you to join the conversation and share from your perspective, um, what's that sort of superpower opportunity and special insight that from your leadership you, you would like to bring into the conversation? Yeah, um, thank you. I think that as women, we show up in spaces as our whole selves unapologetically. Uh, for example, I'm an indigenous woman. Um, I'm a mother, a sister, a daughter, an auntie. And when I make decisions or if I make policies for my program, I make them based off of those identities. These identities that we carry are our strength and they're our medicine and they lead us through tough times. When times get hard, we turn, um, we turn to our medicine to, to really carry us through. And when we influence policy and make decisions based off of those identities, we're a force and we can be, um, we'll be fierce. And so I, I think that the strongest identity that I do carry and I get to carry it with so many other women is being a mother. All of the, the decisions that I make is for on behalf um, and for the benefit of the next generation. Yeah. Nikki, thank you so much. And you know, as we bring Gail in to sort of bring her voice into this conversation, I think picking up from the strands from you and Lola, like really take our fierce power, recognizing the fragility and the real challenges that are out there, but all of our identities coming into that conversation. And when I think about the role and leadership, Gail, for you, both your values and leadership and taking it into the political arena and the state legislature, you know, just, you know, your thoughts about the opportunities for women's leadership right now. Well, I couldn't agree with more with what Nikki and Lola were saying. And, you know, I think one of the things that I think about is when I first walked into the state house as a legislator um, nine years ago, the state house in Rhode Island is uh, has portraits of every single governor um, hanging on the walls. So all of the artwork in the entire building, uh, with the exception of a couple of statues, are white men. Um, and the first time I walked through those halls and saw all of those portraits of white men, what I thought was missing is the story that got those men there. Who were the women in their lives that helped make that happen? The story of caregiving has always been underrepresented um, in our entirety and, and devalued. Um, and so what I think we're really at the cusp of now, of now you know, partially from political movements, partially from the experience of COVID, is some of these issues are really up in the forefront and people realize that until we actually address those issues, we are gonna continue to keep um, women from being full participate, from fully participating in our, in our workforce and in our political representation. And I think that for the most part, women have reached the point in which they're tired of being marginalized by that. So I think that we're really at an opportunity where we're going to see those voices um, pushing even farther and really pushing to make sure that these policy issues are on the forefront of what we do next for our nation. Yeah, thank you, Gail. I really appreciate that. Let's bring everybody into the conversation. And I think you know, we've talked about this from the beginning and all of our um, esteemed guests have raised the importance of centering racial and gender equity and justice in the work, whether from community to elected to philanthropy. Um, and, you know, so Nikki, you and I have talked a lot about this. Um, what does the kind of 
world need to you know know um, when we think about and um, to get to get behind the you know indigenous women's leadership, their approach, their contributions, their leadership, as we think um, about our shared commitment to disrupting and dismantling inequitable and unjust and ineffective systems and practices. Thank you so much, Anne. I'd like to first share that many of our tribal communities are matriarchal societies. Women are the backbone of our people, and in bringing life into this world, we protect and preserve the future of our people. Our men, our spiritual leaders, our two-spirit relatives recognize this, that we're the backbones of our society. We're leading in communities at the federal level, such as Deb Holland, legislative level, such as Therese Davids, leading institutions of higher education, such as Dr. Laurel Vermillion. We're leading our tribal communities like Fawn Sharp, and we're even leading nonprofit organizations. Our communities have traditional ceremonies that uplift women. And if I can briefly share that my own tribal community has one called scalp dance. And when our men were off hunting or on war parties, our women protected the children at the camp and sometimes having to fend off enemies in battle. Um, and so when our men returned from the war parties, they gave women their horses. They painted our women's faces with war paint. They gave them their bows and arrows and took off their war bonnets and put it on the women. They did this as a way to symbolize that women are the true warriors of our people. We carry the strengths and resilience of our ancestors and our people advance forward, not for our own benefit, but for the next generation. And we do this in ways that honor our culture. Um, for example, we need to dismantle what predominant society tells us leadership looks like. And when we indigenize leadership, we think in terms of humility, generosity, compassion, respect, truth, wisdom, prayer, and more. Thank you so much, Nikki. And, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier, this, the founding of this country deeply fraught from the beginning that um, through genocide and conquest stamped that out. And how are we bringing that back, mm -hmm. um, let alone the histories of 400 years of slavery plus? So I just thank you for bringing that in. Mm -hmm. Gail, um, you know, just love to you know hear your thoughts specifically as we think about what's the role and responsibility of white women in today's leadership moment at this generational moment um, of change and demand to do it really differently. Uh so that is such a good question, and I and I think that Nikki is really hitting um, a really important point here. So we have uh, in this country an overarching idea of what power and leadership are, and it's very defined within a white patriarchal view of what it is. But there's actually extraordinary leadership among women, and we don't need to put our in a position in which we are just replicating the exact same way that leader, true leaders, and I, in fact, I think that's the way that our nation is going to move forward is with uh, redefining what leadership is. So I think for white women, it's actually having conversations with other white women at the beginning to start pushing to have those conversations to get people out of their comfort zone. You know, I, I think the only way we're going to be able to redefine that leadership is by acknowledging that that's the thing that's that's keeping white women um, silent in their own activities uh, is there is that they're not willing to come out of the comfort zone. We have been, you know, trained as we have been raised in the society that not to rock the boat, to smooth things over, to make everything okay, to um, make sure that we are the people pleasers. And not that women's leadership isn't about collaborative and consensus building in a way that makes people come to some place together that could feel comfort, but it's going to feel uncomfortable for a while. And people need to be able to sit with us and have sit with that and then have conversations with each other about what will it really look like if we can get through this space together and to the other side as a stronger, different type of leadership. Yeah. Gail, I, I really appreciate your comments. And, and I would just add in before we go to Lola for her perspective, I just think, you know, the the urgent call for white women to really sit with and acknowledge their both their privilege um, and, you know, where and how they benefit at the expense of others is, a, is really a new conversation that goes from everything from our policy and our politics to also thinking about our parenting and really just our roles in that area. And so I just wanted to 
um, conversation and very much like alive in my head and my heart as well. Um, so I, I put myself in it with uh, um, three phenomenal women here. Lola, so the importance of just time to reimagine leadership, also power, you sit in philanthropy. Um, where for those in the social sector, philanthropy can really define at times um, what is good leadership or effective leadership or where resources go and don't go. And um, we'd love to hear your thoughts about what you're seeing emerging and even needs to happen more when we think about the role of philanthropy and women's leadership and specifically through an intersectional lens and thinking about power shifting and building. Thank you, Anne. It's, um, as I noted earlier, it's a fascinating time um, that's required philanthropy to kind of pull itself together um, and exercise the humility um, that Gail noted and the um, our history in authentic ways, um, as, as Nikki uh, has mentioned. Um, so what, what's exciting right now is seeing that leadership play out. We think about Mackenzie Scott, Lorene Powell Jobs, where they have made massive investments that are bold, that name the issue, and that give visibility to organizations that have never had that opportunity. So in philanthropy, um, that is a traditionally very white space, what I encourage is our women of color, who we are there, um, maybe not in the levels that we deserve, but we are there, that we be bold, um, as I think as we have been, but now is the opportunity to, to even be more courageous and be more relentless in um, delivering on the dream of both our ancestors, um, our children, um, and ourselves. Uh, it is so exciting um, to see uh, philanthropy articulate wrongs in the ways that they uh, endeavor to right them. But what I fear is uh, there is a, a, a tendency to speak loudly and boldly at the beginning of a battle and to lose that energy when things get rough and things aren't yet that rough. We are riding a, a wave right now. And so what I hope is that we stay in this game as partners, as colleagues, we center the leadership away from the dollars and philanthropy actually to the people on the ground who are doing the work that we name who they are. I can name them. Puni Jackson, who's in Hawaii, leading Kakua Kalihi Valley, centering young people and women in her work. Wendy Ellis, who's doing community, community collaborative work, um, centered at George Washington University, but with a national perspective. Aisha Miyandoro, giving direct cash to Black moms living in public housing, dispelling the myth of the welfare queen, and telling the world that Black women can handle it. <laughs> uh, we have been handling it. Uh, but we need to be able to be seen um, in that power. So there is so much hope and opportunity. But again, we cannot forget the hard work it took to get here. And we cannot let go um, or release or relinquish our responsibility to continue um, keeping that momentum going for the next generation. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so well said. And I love you listed up. Um, uh, lifted up some amazing leaders, happen to be some Ascend Fellows, but there are so many women and so many women of color who are getting it done um, and leading. Um, well, one thing I just wanted, I want to sneak in one question is we're also recognizing um, Labor Day around, you know, around this year and thinking about um, the economic aspect. And you also say sort of the courage moments. You know, I wanted to just um, give you a moment, uh, building on Lola's words about naming the issue or naming the opportunity. If you want to just do a lightning um, kind of insight as I'm thinking about the folks listening to us about a chance to just name an issue that you see is we have to take seriously. And so Gail, I'll go to you first, um, uh, but then go around to um, Nikki and Lola before we go into kind of our closing uh, thoughts. Wow, naming one issue. <laughs> I, it's hard to do this. <laughs> there are so, uh, you know, I think there are so many things that we really have to uh, pay attention to. I think um, fundamentally, you know, at, we ha there are two things that really are, my mind is in two different places, I guess. So I, I'm picking two. 
because um, so one is really thinking about women's economic security and how does that actually um, how are our policies going to actually need to change in order to have um, uh, we cannot go back to the economy that we had prior to COVID and think that everything is going to be the same um, or think that things will be better. And, you know, we need to make strong investments in childcare and paid leave and recognize that there are important policies that are preventing women from being fully engaged uh, in our political participation and in our economy. Um, and the second thing for me really is uh, about voting rights. We are seeing an extraordinary attack on uh, voting rights across this country. And frankly, it's no surprise that it's coming up in this moment because those two things are really tied together. Um, if you suppress people's ability to be involved in the political process, you are actually affecting what policies are really gonna change in our nation. And um, until we, reach a point where people can actually have full participation in voting, we aren't gonna see full participation in policy making changes. And the unintended or the intended consequences of that will be to keep women's voices quiet and particularly women of color. Yeah, thank you. Um, Nikki, I wanted to invite you as you think about, and you'll go whatever direction you want, but I wanted to also give a real shout out to what power looks like in action. And for friends out there, you know, was really um, inspired to stand behind and alongside Nikki when she led an effort by the Aspen Institute to really hold um, former U.S. Senator Rick Santorum uh, accountable for irresponsible, racist, erasure remarks um, a couple months ago and led an effort to send a letter to the CEO of CNN demanding accountability and speaking out in those moments. That's real power, that's courage. And, um, you know, just wanted to just first really um, acknowledge and recognize the kind of leadership you demonstrate on behalf of the Aspen Institute every day um, and for the Center for Native American Youth. Um, but, you know, also as you're thinking about naming the issue or the opportunity, you know, what power looks like and in, in, in the courage that goes with it. Mm, thank you, and. Um, I, I think the biggest issue that comes to the forefront of my mind is addressing um, and fighting the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic. Um, indigenous women and girls are subjected to violence at disproportionate rates. Um, we go missing or murdered and blamed to be um, victims of our own demons. And, you know, I my heart just hurts right now because there are four girls in my tribal community who look just like me that are missing. and. I, I think about even, um, you know, we have data and science that tells us the Indigenous Future Survey. Indian country recognizes that this is one of the top priorities that needs to be addressed. Um, in response to that, the Center for Native American Youth created a fellowship for young women and girls um, to address this issue through uh, digital arts and storytelling. Um, everybody has a connection to this issue in Indian country. And um, I think with that also goes addressing invisibility, um, addressing uh, police um, violence and jurisdictions within um, you know, the federal government and tribal jurisdictions. There are so many more um, factors, um, intergenerational trauma that, that we need to address that kind of go and are interconnected with this issue of missing and murdered. Um, and so that's kind of what comes to the top of my mind right now. But when I reflect on leadership, the second part of your question, and I think about the importance of even through hard times, even when my heart aches, I still lean on a thread to celebrate resiliency and celebrate that, um, you know, other people's resiliency and celebrating and uplifting every level of leadership. Because when one of us succeeds, we leave a ladder down for our little sisters. We leave a ladder down for the next generation. And as a Native woman, um, even at the Aspen Institute, I might be the first, but I refuse to be the last. And I think that that's something that we carry with us as women. We can't, we may be the first in some spaces, but we need to leave that ladder down for the next generation. Thank you, Nikki. Lola. I just want to note um, two ways in which uh, women's leadership has manifested that I hope that we shed a light on. One is, as was alluded to earlier, a little bit of the power shifting that's going on between white women and women of color. It's a, it's a difficult transition, so I can acknowledge that. But when done well, it does such good in spades, not only for the individuals who are sharing that power, 
but for the institution and for modeling the way that we can lead with grace. And uh, what has come up in these conversations is around sort of um, the, the soft things that are um, connected to women's leadership, that is humility, the ego, the grace and gratitude. But those, those are the magic bits. That's the secret. Um, and what makes women so successful when they're given the space to be the leaders who they already are. Uh, so I, I just wanted to, to note that and say that um, it's, again, such a fascinating time for us to be a better nation because we have more voices in the room, more voices who are valued, um, and and uh, a, a new way of showing what leadership looks like. Um, it's not about the one, it's about the all. So I'm just really thrilled to see that all more visible. Um, so my note. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, really powerful. Thank you, Lola, and the powerful comments. And we're going to close out with um, kind of last words from each of you on really the theme of building solidarity. And um, you know, as Lola, you just said, we will be a better nation and we will be better people if we meet this moment um, and in the right way. And, you know, on the ladders, you know, putting ladders to help others um, come and as we think about the um, the saying lifting as we climb belonging to you know centered in african-american women's leadership and mm -hmm. specifically the national council for negro women who that was their motto um i want to i was going to just bring a quote from amanda gorman um uh who the u.s inaugural poet um an activist who just amazing thing seven months ago um, electrified and captured um, the attention of the full country. And in her poem, An Ode to Women, um, to the Women of the Earth, she says, alone, a woman is a root curling for change, but together women are a forest alive with spirit, a riotous power, the most timeless pact, a call to a call to all those who hear it. And so when we think about the opportunity we have to move forward together, if we can close out with what in your words, in your advice, would strategic solidarity look like to realize our full power to make the change? So Gail, I'll go to you first, if I may. Such beautiful words. I think, you know, what I think about is I, I, I both have had the role as a state legislator and have had the privilege of working with um, Family Values at Work uh, advocates in states across the country advocating for paid leave. And when I hear those words, what I think about is something that I have really seen happen and important to recognize is that, you know, when you, when people focus on doing things, policy change incrementally, they often push to the side, the people who are most impacted by the policies. And you take a quick win without thinking about what, um, what the unintended consequences of that quick win are, as opposed to centering the people who are most need that to be a bold policy. And I know from the my own work and the work of Family Values at Work uh, organizations that that's, we don't, we don't view that as being good policy. We view good policy as being when everybody is actually gonna benefit from it. And so I guess for me, that solidarity is about being bold and recognizing that we don't have to take little crumbs, but we can actually use our collective power to change the future of our country. And we can do it uh, one bill at a time in the legislatures, but we can actually do it by changing the whole idea of what leadership is. Yeah, yeah, and governance too. Fantastic, Gail. Lola. Um, I think we, we have an opportunity to activate uh, those who have not been activated in the past. So we have grandmothers, who are sitting at home right now, caring for their grandkids, their children, keeping communities together. But they haven't been um, brought in to the conversation in real ways around one 
what leadership is and they themselves are leaders um, and how they can engage in the civic conversation. And so we, what I think is our strategic moment is to start to lean in to those, um, those leaders who haven't received the awards, who haven't been named as leaders, but are the heroes in their networks. Um, and alongside that, um, acknowledge uh, our, our male allies. They are, they are there too. And so adding, layering on this intersectionality lens, leaning into gender, but also recognizing the um, opportunity for our activated male allies to be part of this conversation and to lift women up that are around them. That's our, that's our real, uh, another strategic power for us. You know, I was um, thinking, and I actually have, it's, uh, I keep it at my desk, it's two little buffalo. Um, I keep them at my desk because it's a reminder of this cultural teaching um, when there's a buffalo hunt and one buffalo gets shot at to go down, the entire herd will come and lift up that buffalo and keep running together um, to support one another. And I'm reflecting back to when Lola had talked about indigenous solidarity for Black Lives Matter and what true solidarity and allyship looks like, even when we're not um, you know, recognized for it. Um, but I, I'm, I'm always drawn to this metaphor of these buffaloes. When times get hard, we lift each other up that's what good relatives do. That's what sisters do in solidarity who love each other and care about each other and want each other to succeed. And so when I think about, you know, solidarity, I'm, I'm brought back to, to this, this vision of um, lifting each other up when times are hard, um, lifting each other up and celebrating each other when times are good. Um, and then also being the voice um, for, for folks when you're just too tired to speak, um, when, when it's a little too hard to keep going, um, what can I do to make sure that your voice is still heard in the space even when, it's, even when my voice may shake? Um, and so when, when I do think about solidarity, of course, I, I think culturally of Buffalo. Wow. Nikki, thank you so much. And you leave us with a very powerful visual and story as we go forward. And, you know, I hope all of you out there joining us as we think about this milestone moment, um, we think about all that you've heard in this conversation and most importantly, the work ahead. I think one essence truth hearing from each of you is change also happens. Um, in relationship to the depth of trust and relationship and knowing when and how to lead behind, beside, and make space to give the mic, the stage, the power um, to other leaders um, and leaders of color and women who have not been able to be at that table um, or proximate to the, you know, the problems we're trying to solve. So as we close out, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I want to thank Nikki, Lola, and Gail for your leadership every day, your partnership every day, and close out with the phenomenal words of Audre Lorde, um, Black feminist, lesbian, poet, mother, and incredible warrior, and Shiro, where she said, I am not free while any woman is unfree, even when her shackles are very different from my own. Let us remember that we can only go together, go, go forward together, because if we all are not there, if we are all not part of that solution, we will not realize the dream and the opportunity. So thank you again, Nikki, Lola, Gail, and everybody go forth, recommit, and let us all keep building strategic solidarity with and among one another. Thanks for joining us then together. Thank you.